thank you all for coming and spend a little time with us talking about conservation easements. My name is Payla Hoyt. I'm the lands director with Five Valleys Land Trust. Um, and I talked my coworker Ryan into joining us. If you could introduce yourself as well. My name is Ryan Chapin, and I'm also with Five Valleys Land Trust. I'm the stewardship director. So we'll make a, we each have different um, aspects of conservation easements that we'll talk about. So, and it wasn't hard for Payla to talk me into coming. <laughs> That way you won't get too bored of listening to me. But, um, but I work with landowners to um, put conservation easements on their property. And then once an easement is in place, then Ryan takes over and he works with them on the stewardship. And we'll talk about both of those aspects today. So, and we're with Five Valleys Land Trust. We're a, a local community-based nonprofit um, based out of the Missoula area. And then we also work in the valleys that kind of radiate out from around around Missoula. We started in 1972 um, and we um, we do public acquisitions so things like Mount Jumbo and the Alberton <coughs> Gorge. We also do a lot of trail work like portions of the Hiawatha Trail but the main thing we do are conservation easements with private landowners and so that'll be the focus of what we talk about today. And um, so and conservation easements are a a voluntary legal agreement between a landowner and a land trust where the landowner agrees to limit certain uses of their property, the most significant of which are subdivision and development, although there are other limitations as well, and then the, in, in order to protect the natural qualities of that property. And then the land trust job is to ensure that those mutually agreed upon terms are honored over time. And so we, um, so once an easement is signed, we we visit the property every every single year, forever, <laughs> um, in perpetuity, and uh, and and we visit with the landowner just to make sure that there aren't any changes on the property that would um, harm those natural values that we agreed to protect over time, and um, and our the those land those visits with landowners are are cordial and friendly our our approach to easement stewardship, which is what we call what happens once an easement is signed, um, is, it's, is it's, it's based on a s maintaining good relationships with landowners because what land trusts have found all <coughs> over the country is if you want to ensure that your easement is honored over time, the best way to do that is to maintain good relationships with landowners. So we, we treat these relationships as partnerships um, and they're, they're friendly and we, uh, you know, they're, they're generally just really nice visits um, and we're, where we look at bigger picture things, not just, you know, if one tree was cut or like measuring stubble height or something like that, we're looking for, it was a new house put on the property or is, was the property subdivided. Um, but that's not to say that easements don't have teeth. You know, they are, um, you know, we, when we sign an easement, we're agreeing to enforce those terms of the easement. And if, if those terms aren't honored, then, um, then the easement gives us the the right to to stop actions on the property that would harm those, like bulldozing a wetland area, maybe, or some, or you know, putting a new house that was that's not allowed by the easement. Um, and we we are prepared to take landowners to court if we have to. Um, thankfully, we've never had to. We've never been involved in any kind of issue like that. Although, if we have to, we we could do that. But our goal is to never ever end up in court with a landowner. Um, so I got a question. How mm -hmm. do you deal with non-landowner mineral owners? Um, what we do is in, in, the, in <coughs> Montana, we generally assume that the mineral estate has been severed from the surface estate. Yes, exactly. And so um, the structure that's been <coughs> set up by the federal government for landowners to address that is that we hire a, um, a geologist to conduct a, an ass a mineral assessment of the property where they determine the likelihood of commercial mineral development. And if the likelihood of that commercial mineral development is so remote as to be negligible, then we feel fairly comfortable proceeding. Um, but if um, that comes back and there, it does look like there'd be a likelihood of commercial mineral development, then we would have to have more analysis done. Sometimes we might be able to proceed with the easement and sometimes we might not because an easement only affects the surface estate. It doesn't, it can't prevent mineral, it can't 
affect the mineral estate unless the landowner of the surface estate also owns the mineral estate. So, so if the mineral owner had rights to use the, the surface, what would that the, you well, would still, I mean, I'm speaking yeah, of a specific yeah, yeah. easement that's with another mm -hmm. trust company. Yeah, so um, we've, um, we've haven't had any problems ourselves um, with easements that we hold, but I do know of um, other land trusts, especially ones in eastern Montana, and they have an easement on the surface estate. Um, and then with all the oil and gas development that's happening, there have been um, owners mm -hmm. of the mineral estate who've come in and have then drilled for oil on mm -hmm. the easement property. The easement can help ensure that the impacts of that development are minimized because they still can't just totally trash the surface estate. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a that can be a challenge. Um, but we're but when we have these mineral um, assessments done, we can at least go in with our eyes wide open. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, owner you know landowners do own the mineral estate, and mm -hmm. in that case, we can actually this is prevent when mineral extraction. And yeah. Mm -hmm. owns, and this yeah. Is what my concerns are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So and that can be challenging, is. especially in okay, um, thank eastern you. Montana. Yeah. Uh -huh. The mineral laws all seem to be different from state to state. Mm -hmm. A number of states, if they're not, if, if a mineral right is not exercised by a third party, it expires after so many years. No. Is that not, not the in case Montana. in Montana? No, Montana has a specific uh, mining area clause to their government. It's specific area of mineral laws, mining laws. Yeah, mineral and we just assume they're all owned separately mm -hmm. unless and, um, and we can, can be shown segregate otherwise. segregate them and own them permanent, perpetually for yeah. forever, yes. Yeah, so, um, and that's just a, a challenge that a lot of land trusts including have in, this, in the state. Mine, yeah. Including oil. Yeah. Did you have a question back there? Yeah. Yeah, what percentage would you say is the, where the mineral rights are separate from the surface rights? I, I don't know. Um, like I said, we just assume they're always severed. Um, and in the nine years I've been doing this work, um, I think I know of two cases where projects I've worked on where they've owned the mineral estate. So it really is pretty common to not own it, especially in Western Montana where most of those mineral rights came under the ownership of the Anaconda Copper Company. So. Um, So I think I was yes I was talking about enforceability that um, that that we have you know that we have great rela relationships with the landowners we work with but that's not to, to say that easements aren't 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 enforceable they have teeth um, and they're a really serious thing to do on your property they're definitely not for everyone and I think for for landowners who do easements it's 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 one of the most uh, important and serious decisions they ever make about their land. So it's definitely not something to be entered into lightly and it's um, not for everyone and it's a good thing to to take a long time in doing it because it is such a such a serious thing. And we're one of several land trusts in Montana um, and several that actually operate in this area but different ones have kind of different focuses. So there's like the Elk Foundation, they focus more on elk habitat. Um, there's turkey. what there's what turkey. and but I don't think in Montana they hold easements maybe in other places they do so um, and then there there's some statewide ones like the Montana Land Reliance they operate here there's some national ones like Nature Conservancy which in our area they don't do as many easements now they do more of the larger Plum Creek acquisitions but in other parts of the state they still do easements um, and in Montana um, land trusts, where we actually have a statewide association called the Montana Association of Land Trusts. And so if you're interested in kind of just generally learning about all the land trusts in Montana, you can go to the Montana Association of Land Trusts and it's got contact information for all the different, all the different land trusts. Um, and um, many of us are part of the uh, a national, we have a national trade association um, and we, many of us in Montana are also accredited land trusts, which means that a, a third party has taken a really close look at our policies, our procedures, and our financials, and have determined that we operate at the highest standard. So most of the Montana Association of Land Trust members are accredited, we're an accredited land trust, and that's just a, we think that's an important thing for landowners to know that 
that we're reputable and we are organized to make sure that we are going to be here for, for the long haul. Um, but in, in Montana, there's also um, some governmental entities that hold easements. For example, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks holds conservation easements, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service holds easements. Um, the city of Missoula holds a couple. So, um, and, and each of these easements are different. Um, each of the entities that hold them kind of approach easements differently. So if you've heard something about an easement um, that you like or you don't like, that doesn't necessarily mean that if you were to do it on your land that that's what it would, that's what it would look like. Um, and in Montana, the, um, the conservation easements were established as a tool by the legislature in the mid-70s. Um, I think the first one was done in 76, the first easement. Um, and they've, they've just become a lot more widespread. Um, Montana is actually one of the leading states in the country when it comes to, to how many different landowners have done easements. I think there's over a million acres in Montana protected by, by easements. And um, because so many people have done them, um, they're just a lot less scary for landowners. You know, a lot more people either have personal experience with them or they know someone who's done one. And so we just, there just seems to be growing and growing interest because, you know, we do our best to provide as much helpful information for landowners <coughs> as possible. But when landowners can actually talk to another landowner who has an easement about what it's like, that's just can be really helpful in them, you know, understanding what it feels like from a landowner's perspective. So um, we actually have, um, in, s in some places, kind of more landowner interest than we can even even address since it, it, it takes so long to do to do an easement. But there's there are definitely people are seem to be more and more comfortable with them. And and if any of you are interested in talking with landowners who have easements on their land, then you know just come up and visit with us afterward, or contact con you can contact us with the info inside the packet there, and we can share some names with folks who've said they're willing to talk with other with other landowners. Um, the, the process of, of doing a conservation easement um, can be lengthy. Um, I think the, the quickest that you would be able to do an easement would be four months, but, that, but it generally takes a lot longer than that. I mean, I think a year is a good amount of time, um, but it can even take longer than that. And um, that's because we spend a long time just trying to get to know each other get to know the landowner and really understand what their goals are for the for the property, really understand the property well. And then the landowners also just need to get to know us and build trust with us because these, you know, easements really do depend on having a trusting land uh, relationship with the landowner and, and the land trust. And once we once we do know each other and understand what the landowner's goals are and, and they know where we're coming from, then we can um, start kind of zeroing in on the on the easement drafting. And um, that also takes takes quite a long time. We have a standard template that we kind of start with, but um, there's a lot of going back and forth to make sure that those terms really fit the property and fit the landowner's goals and are something that we feel like we can actually enforce over time. Um, and I think it's important and it's a good thing for it to take that long because easements are permanent and except for in really small situations, or a really small set of situations, they can't be changed. So you, you wanna make sure that you're getting it right. So I think that that's time well spent. Um, and as part of the process of doing easements, there's also a, num a number of other things that need to be done, like this mineral investigation. Um, we investigate title. We have a um, assessment done of, um, and a report done for what the conservation values are the, of are the property. and. There's various other steps, so it's a pretty, a pretty cumbersome project or process. Um, and the the reason or the 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 purposes for doing easements in Montana, um, we can do easements that protect wildlife habitat. We can do easements that protect the scenic values of the property and the agricultural values of the property. We can do easements that. Um, provide for recreational opportunities for the public, like trail corridors or hunting access. Um, and in Montana, you can also do easements for historical and education purposes, but that's, that doesn't happen very much in Montana. It's mostly for the wildlife habitat, the scenic and agricultural values, and the, the recreational access, or um, yeah, 
access for the public. And but easements don't have to be done for all of those purposes on every single easement. So for example, some easements might be more geared toward protecting the agricultural values, other ones for protecting the wildlife values. Um, some easements can require public access, but they don't have to. So that's part of that, just understanding what the landowner is really trying to accomplish and what, as a land trust, we feel like actually makes sense for that, for that property. And then once you determine what your, your goals are for the property, then you draft your easement terms to make sure you meet those goals. So the terms for an easement that's set up to protect agricultural values might be different than one that's for, to protect wildlife values or to provide public access. And in terms of why landowners do easements, um, there, um, I kind of think there's kind of like four main reasons, and it's usually a combination of these things. Um, landowners do them because their land holds special value for them and they want to make sure that someone will be there to look after it after they've gone. Um, one landowner we worked with who told us that he uh, he loves his land even more now that it's protected because he just knows that once he's gone it's going to stay that way and someone's actually going to be looking after that so there can be a lot of real kind of personal meaning for folks when they do easements. Um, so there can also be some estate estate planning aspects of it so some landowners will do a conservation easement when they're thinking about how they want to pass their land on to the next generation um, you know and how it can be split up between the next generation um, and sometimes they do that with the next generation right there at the table um, and sometimes they their kids aren't a part of it at all and they're just like I want to make sure it's done this way when my lands passed on and <laughs> they can live with it when they get it <laughs> so um, and then there's also there can be a, some estate tax benefits to easements um, that I'm not qualified to describe what that means specifically you would want to talk with an accountant about that um, but um, sometimes especially for folks who have large land holdings when they try to pass that land on to the next generation the estate taxes can be so onerous that they have to sell some of the property in order to pay off those estate benefits. And so if you have a conservation easement on your property, it, it reduces your estate tax burden and can facilitate passing the land on to the next generation. There's also some um, income tax um, benefits for doing conservation easements. Um, and though those are actually in flux right now. Um, so I can tell you what, what they are now, but they've, they're actually going through Congress right now and will hopefully be getting better um, if they can make it through Congress. So we'll see about that. Um, but, we have a lot of faith uh, in Congress. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, it's going so fast, it's kind well, of surprising. Is it going to be retroactive? Um, it, if it is retroactive, it would probably just be retroactive to 2015. That's how they've done it in the past. But right now, the benefits are you can deduct up to 30% of your adjusted gross income, and you can spread that over a period of up to five years until you've used up the amount of the, of the easement donation, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a minute. Um, and, but if these enhanced ones are passed, then you can deduct up to 50% of your adjusted gross income and spread that over 16 years. But if you wanna, if you wanna take advantage of that deduction, you have to have an appraisal done which can also be somewhat expensive. So for folks with smaller properties, sometimes they it ends up kind of being too expensive to have that appraisal done and they end up just maybe just donating the easement but not actually getting to take advantage of those income tax deductions. Um, and I'll explain more about how those appraisals work in a minute. But And then the last reason is that there can be financial incentives for doing easements. Um, there are a number of different funding programs out there. And so in some cases we can actually pay landowners to do an easement on their property. Um, we can't, we end up not being able to pay the same amount they could get if they were to subdivide and develop their property. So if, you know, if it's, if the reason to do one is just to make the same amount that you could from subdividing it, it usually doesn't make that kind of financial are sense. You, are you limited by like tax appraised values? Mm -hmm, yep, okay. yeah, and, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, but, um, <coughs> but it can be it can be meaningful money and um, can make a big difference and uh, in for folks um, and quite a few landowners we work with actually will 
sell an easement on their property and then use it to maybe buy the adjacent property. Maybe they've been leasing for grazing for a long time and actually kind of grow their operation. So, um, you know, that financial incentive can be pretty meaning meaningful so for some folks. Um, but the one caveat about the financial incentives is that no money is free and all that money comes with strings attached. And so if someone, for example, if someone just does a, a donated easement, that's a relationship between the, the land trust and the landowner. But if you do an easement with funding from the federal government, for example, through the Farm Bill, then the federal government is part of the easement and, and they want certain things in that easement um, that, that have to be there if their money is going to be spent on it. Or if Fish, Wildlife, and Parks puts money into an easement, they always have to have public access for hunting on the property. And so that's a pretty significant string that's attached to that funding. Um, and, and then other, you know, other funders have other requirements for funding. And so you end up having these extra strings attached and then it just is, it's a much lengthier process to actually complete the, the, the easement as well. So it can be meaningful, but there's definitely some kind of sometimes some negatives to it. Yeah. Uh, could you give us an idea of how many of them, what percentage of them are donated and what percentage you purchase? Uh? Well, the, there, there are more financial incentives than there used to be. Um, and so it's becoming more and more common for us to be able to come up with funding to do purchase easements. Um, and I think it's different in different places just depending on where there's funding and where there isn't. For example, in Missoula County, we have the open space bond. And in Ravalli County, there's the open space bond, um, both of which are just wonderful programs that, that um, are very reasonable and their strings that are attached really make sense for Montana, where some of the federal programs have strings that might make sense for farms in Vermont, but maybe not in Montana. <laughs> um, um, and, but if you're outside of those two counties, it can be harder to find funding for, for easements. Um, but I think the majority of the easements we do nowadays are purchased ones. Um, but the federal funding sources are getting to be a lot harder to, to come by, so that, it may not stay that way. And let me, I'll talk a little bit about how they're valued. <laughs> So if, you, if you're interested in the estate tax benefits or the income tax benefits or in being paid to do an easement on your property, we, we have to end up having to have an appraisal done and the appraisal needs to be done by a separate appraiser. You know, we, it can't be so, we can't, we're not, we can't be appraising the value of easements. Can and it be like a certified real estate agent who's certified to do appraisals? Um, there's it actually, specialist? it's a special kind of appraisal and you have to um, take special courses. So there's actually mm -hmm. a pretty small pool of appraisers that can do these easements appraisals because they're different from other appraisals. And when you do an easement appraisal, you actually do two different appraisals. So the first thing you do is you do an appraisal of the property without the easement on it. Um, with you know all the all the development rights associated with it that that particular property might have, um, and let's just say for this example that the east that the property appraises at six hundred thousand dollars, and then the appraiser imagines that the easement is in place, and we give them a copy of the easement, and they see oh we've um, the landowner has agreed that. Um, they can only build one more house on the property and that's it. And other than that, the property has to stay together forever. And so they, they will then compare what that property would be like with the easement on it with other easement properties um, it, that are similar and you know looks at what they sell and then they compare that with, with this property. And they come up with a value of, you know this is our estimate of what the property would be worth after the easement is on the property. Mm -hmm. And then you just subtract those two and you get what the conservation easement is worth. And so, um, just one thing to note is that easements don't reduce property values like they used to, partly because a lot more people are comfortable with them, a lot more people have them, and there's also a wider pool of people out there in the world who are who are happy to buy land with an easement on it because they don't want to subdivide it anyway. You know, if it's land along the Blackfoot River, they might be perfectly happy to 
leave it as is because they want to hunt and fish there and enjoy the river and and so they're willing to pay a decent amount for that money that property even though it has an easement on it so um, easements and these days just aren't appraising for the high dollars that they used to in the past so in this example though this easement would appraise for two hundred thousand dollars and then if someone wanted to take a tax deduction, their charitable donation would be $200,000. And then they could deduct up to 30% of their adjusted gross income um, until they reach this $200,000 mark, which some people, if you have a high income, you might reach that quickly. Um, or if you don't, then you could spread that out over, over many years. And then if we are able to find funds to purchase an easement, then this is the maximum amount we, we're legally allowed to pay a landowner for an easement. But we usually aren't able to pay the full easement value. We usually can't quite get to this amount. Um, very few funding sources are set up to pay the full value of the easement. They usually require a landowner to donate some portion of the value. And that's why if, you, if you're interested in coming out financially whole as much as you would to just develop your land then an easement's probably not the best route but if you want to make sure your land um, stays the way it is over time and you'd like a little bit of money then sometimes these can be helpful so like in a scenario like this we might be able to come up with a hundred thousand dollars to pay a landowner for an easement <coughs> and then they would donate the other hundred thousand dollars worth is there a is there a kind of a average percentage it really varies on the just funding just sources on the Yep. Funding source and then on the land use. Yep. So, for example, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, they only operate in three areas in Montana. These are the highest priority areas for wildlife, and they can pay full value for easements, but they're one of the only entities out there who can pay full value. Um, with the Missoula County, um, we we end up being able to pay landowners like 30% of this value or maybe up to 50% sometimes a little higher but it really just depends on the property and it takes a long time to figure out you know what funding sources might fit um, with with that property and sometimes we'll be cobbling together like a federal source and a local source and that that ends up kind of taking a while but but it can be um, you know this is just this is just for an example easements end up being valued differently depending on the property and and it can be meaningful money for some folks so I have another question. Yeah. I assume that the yeah. conservation easement then is recorded with the county. Yep. Is, are the terms part of the public record or are they, yep. so if one wants to know what a, what a conservation easement said, mm -hmm. you can go down to the courthouse and find out. Yep. yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and those were the main things that I wanted to visit about before turning it over to Ryan, but do, does it, anyone have any questions about the things that I brought up so far? No. Nope. Okay. Hey, well, hey. Um, Ryan, so that's kind of the process of putting one on your property and um, this is where, this is the really important stuff. Stewardship. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, first of all, I was very excited to see that this was sponsored by Montana State University because I'm from, I, MSU is my alma mater, and so I just kind of felt weird walking across the Grizz campus. So. <laughs> Go Bobcats. Yeah. Woo! As you, as I mean, you should. <laughs> I know, I know, and I know. Yeah, so. Well, so most of the uh, extension services, all except the forestry, is out of Bozeman. Are out, yeah. yeah. yeah but right, the forestry yeah. is part of this university. That's right. So there's kind so of a, kind of a, good, a good blend Take there. your pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. So. Well, and my wife teaches at this university too, so. Yeah, so. Oh, you're very good. That's the one way. Appreciate it. So, no, thanks for coming um, to hear about conservation easements, and I hope that at the end of this talk, you know, that all of you will have a pretty accurate understanding of what conservation easements really are. And Pela told you a, a lot about uh, what goes, in, uh, goes into an easement on the front end. And we kind of have a joke in the office between Pala and I, and um, or stewardship and and project work, Pro project managers. They'll say, "Farmer Smith's easement is done." And the stewardship, we're sitting there thinking, "What do you mean done? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's recorded. I'll give you that much, yeah. but it's not done." 
So that's where, that's where stewardship um, kind of takes up. And, and really, as Pela mentioned, it's, it's a relationship between the land trust and the, the land owner. And so, so one um, kind of pride point in that is that it's not a relationship between a governmental agency and a landowner, unless you do a conservation easement with like US Fish and Wildlife Service. But for us, we're a private um, nonprofit with 503, 503C status. And, um, and so, I mean, sometimes the, the federal government gets um, woven in there with the, the various funding sources and whatnot. But, but say for a, for a donated um, conservation easement on a traditional farm or ranch, it's the, the landowner who's owned the land, um, sometimes for, for many, many years, and the, the land trust, like ourselves, m coming up with this agreement. Once it's signed, once it's recorded, then um, is, that's where the stewardship staff steps in. And at a bare minimum, um, what we have to do is uh, be on site once a year. And so, so again, to try to dispel any, any misconceptions people might have about, about easements, that's really it. It's if, if the terms of the easement are being, being upheld, um, and there's no question there, a landowner who has an easement will see a land steward once a year. Uh, we have a cup of coffee, talk around the kitchen table, maybe bounce around in the pickup truck on the property, and fill out a report, and good, we'll see you next year. Now, times where we can be more involved with the landowner is at the landowner's discretion. So if, if an instance comes up where the landowner knows they're gonna do a timber harvest in, in the next year, or they really wanna ramp up some weed management and they want help maybe getting a, a cost share um, a grant or helping to fill out an application, something like that. So we also try to help landowners on the resource side of things um, when we can and when we know that that help is, is wanted. So, so that's just kind of the basic framework of what, of what the stewardship department entails. This picture here is a, this is a, um, a ranch that was near um, Drummond, and this is looking at the um, Flint Creek mountain range right there, and you'd have Phillipsburg would be up this way, but that's a, a really beautiful um, spot. There's one the lights out. No, I, I don't know, after lunch it may result in coma. <laughs> Maybe we'll just do one. Yeah. So, and at any time, if anyone has questions, just, um, just holler them out so this can be as informal as, as we want it to be. Um, but what I'll do is just talk a little bit about the various parts of easement stewardship. So in addition to, uh, or, or as a part of project, the project development, you have money that may change hands for the purchase of an easement, but you also have money that needs to change hands for stewardship funding. And so I'll talk about that some. You also have baseline documentation, which is what the, a land steward like myself um, can actually do or make the monitoring visit based off of. Um, then you have the, the, the monitoring. Landowner relations, uh, violation resolutions, and then also then, then record keeping. So that's, that's what I'm gonna touch on. So for, for funding easement stewardship, um, what we have at Five Valleys Land Trust and, and every other land trust is required to, to have this, it's called a stewardship um, fund or a stewardship endowment. And so every time a project um, closes, there's a, a percentage or, or an amount of money, usually five or 10,000, maybe sometimes $12,000 that is put in a specific stewardship fund and so the idea there is that if uh, we never did another project and we never solicited another dollar from members or other funding sources you have this pot of money that you can still make your monitoring visits off of and so so that's a pot of money that is 
uh, never touched except for to pay uh, stewardship staff to keep the easement um, violation free and um, working as it was an in, in, so, intended so to do. So is this money, say if they were doing it strictly for a contribution deduction, would they have to pay you a certain amount? Well, the landowner might not have to actually okay. write the check, but we do need we do need to put money for that project in the stewardship pot, so to speak. And so it can come from the funding source. It could come even from uh, Five Valleys Land Trust ourselves. Um, so there's different ways you can try to come up with that money. Ideally, the landowner would just say, I want to donate the easement. How much is the stewardship fee? We'd say $15,000. They write a check. We put it in the bank. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> but but. It's usually a combination of that, is and how it, how it actually gets gets in there. But but it's um, it's so important that if you're an accredited land trust like we are, you have to be able to prove that a stewardship fee was indeed um, received and put in the appropriate account. So it requires some pretty careful accounting. Right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And so you can, you know, in determining the amount of the funds, um, it it, um, it varies by project. And so one of the, an, an easy example um, to visualize why you'd require a higher stewardship fee is say you have a thousand acre ranch or a piece of property and the um, owner wants to retain the right to split it um, Say, say one time. So they want to be able to sell 500, 500 acres still under easement to somebody or give it to um, one of their kids or an heir and then keep the other 500 for themselves. So that would require a higher stewardship fee because now you have two landowners that you visit with each year. And so even though it might not seem like a big deal, forever is an awful long time and you need to be able to pay you need to be able to assure that the money's there to, to maintain those relationships. Is, is there any kind of government requirement for the amount you have to come up with, or is it just purely computational on your part? Yeah, I think it's more computational. Is there? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah we have a um, um, just a spreadsheet that you can put in the number of splits, <coughs> um, the distance of the property from the home office, mm, um, yeah. things like that, that. So there's some hard figures. <coughs> that you can work off of and and there is some flexibility there because we don't you know we'd hate to not help a landowner out or not get an easement by not having exactly what the stewardship fee entailed so there's a, there's you know there's some give and take but but just out of principle you have to have some money in okay. the bank to, to Thank you. yeah um so we talked about raising funds and then how the funds are managed this is where the um policies and procedures of an accredited land trust comes into play is that um, you can only use the funds for stewarding the easement. So we couldn't say, well, we need to pay the power bill this month, so we're going to use the stewardship fund. It, it has to go for that specific um, need. Presumably the word trust is in there for some reason. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yes. So the landowner uh, may be a participant in this funding and I assume that they have to pay for the title search, mineral research, and the appraisal. I, again, in an ideal scenario, a landowner would come to the land trust and say, I would like to do a conservation easement. And then uh, we would say, okay, are, are you willing to write a check for the various parts? They'd say, yes, absolutely. Um, we do the various parts, the mineral report, the title search, all this. But a lot of times what happens is we find funding for its sources that will cover those costs. So grants, of some grants uh, in Missoula County, it's the Missoula County Open Space Bond Fund where we actually, it didn't used to always be this way, but now project costs like, like what you're <coughs> mentioning, title work and such, can be folded into Kind of like refinancing a house where even though there's uh, origination fees and whatnot, it can be folded into the project. But, but, but as Pala mentioned, anytime you seek additional funding, it takes a lot longer. There's definitely more strings attached. But the majority of the projects, I would say, that we do now, the landowner isn't writing a large check 
each time. Would that be accurate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In relation to the value of the internet. Right. But for those transaction costs. Yeah. Yeah, and we had, and then even you know a decade ago or so, um, I think right before Palin and I both came on board, that there were some projects that made it. They almost almost closed, and then um, the, these project costs were real, and the landowners just oh whoa that's mm, I'm out no way. And so so we realized that at that time that you needed to address that issue. So mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the, the main tool that a land steward has in monitoring these easements is a baseline report. And um, it's, it's, it's not as scientific as it might sound. It's basically a snapshot of what the property looks like and the state the property's in, um, in a pretty general sense, and the structures on the building at the time of closing. So. It would a baseline report would show um, how many houses are there, how many other structures. Um, it would show, say, if there's some rivers or streams going through the property, there'd be pretty good photo points taken along there. Um, and so you have these kind of general. There's no real scientific measurements that go in. For example, you're never going to see well pasture. The upper pasture was at uh, five and a half inches, and on in the middle of June, you know, it, it doesn't get near to anything like that. This is more real broad brush kind of documentation, but it's really helpful. Whereas if a land steward comes onto the property, sees what appears to be a new home in the middle of the upper hay meadow, and you think, well, it didn't seem like that was there last year, and and I know the easement prohibited development in this area, then you'd look at the baseline report, and you'd be able to easily tell if that was indeed there or not. So they're really helpful, but they're not, um, they're certainly not, uh, like I say, it's very scientific in, in what they measure. And then we also have what's called a current conditions report. And uh, so this is kind of a boiled down baseline, um, whereas if we just, we've recently assumed um, a few easements from an, an o another entity and there weren't very good baseline reports that came along with the easement, so we did what was called a current conditions report to just reestablish a baseline, even though it's not done when the easement was completed, it'll at least give people, land stewards in the future, a, a good idea of what the current condition was, say, in 2014. And then easement monitoring. Um, the purpose is is to just have a paper trail or a record of these annual visits on on the the state of the property. And but even more importantly, you know, instead of going out and measuring that grass and saying is it at five and a half inches or, or are there exactly you know a hundred trees on this, but it, it doesn't get into near that level of detail. But what it does is is it just there's a specific set of questions that a land steward has to answer. But even more importantly, from my perspective, it, it's, a, it's, it's something that you can go through the landowner with and try to get an idea of what the landowner's intentions are for the future, and, and that way head off any issues before they were ever to come up. And so, so that's one real value I find with filling out the reports. I mean, they're required, but they're also a way to keep a dialogue going with the landowner. Um, yes? They, they can't be bought and sold because when we hold an easement, it doesn't have value or financial value that we could sell or transfer to someone else. But um, but easements, because they're perpetual, um, they they can't go away like if a nonprofit folds. And so there is a small land trust, all volunteer land trust in Missoula, recently that decided to close its doors. And they had eight easements, and they asked us to take all of their easements. So all their easements were assigned to us, just to make sure that even if the entity goes away, the easement never goes away. And so sure. all of our easements are also set up. So if for some reason we dissolved as an entity, our easements would be assigned to another entity. Um, what if you weren't available to assign them? What would happen to them? Um, Five Valleys could not close its doors until they were assigned. And, and probably what would happen is 
if it came to that point that it would there would be some kind of court proceeding and, and a judge would say okay you're taking these easements and you're taking oh, okay. these. But, but I think. I mean, generally. Like, like as if it were, like a trust would be. I think so, yeah. Sort of like a trust. But definitely yeah. land trusts in Montana and across the country, um, we feel like we're all in this together and that we'll mm -hmm. kind of all rise and fall together. And so we don't, you know, none of us want to see easements out there that are not being monitored. Yeah, but I was and thinking so, like if it were owned by a single person and that person died, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. you, you think that there would probably be a, court proceeding yeah to, or, or to like terminate the tr to deal with the trust yeah. assets and there was another situation. land trust in montana that was also an all-volunteer one and they decided to close their doors and so mm -hmm. one of the other land trusts just said you know we'll, we'll take that easement just because we feel like it's in the best interest of and presumably this tool there are still funds to monitored. to Keep the well, yeah, and if, for instance, the, the ongoing right, the, the eight easements that we assumed, it's, it's kind of like a reverse commodity or a reverse business model where they paid us to take those easements. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we would go out and try to buy easements from other mm -hmm. land trusts because all that does is make more work for us. So it would be odd to do that. Mm -hmm. But but with this instance, we said, yeah, we, we want the integrity of conservation easements to stay really strong. We don't want, they're called orphan easements. So if a, if a, if a um, land trust isn't looking out for a particular easement, it's considered an orphan easement. And so then it could be, you know, we don't want that. And so that's where we said, yeah, we'll take those easements, but we need to take the stewardship fund that you have built up over the years and put it into our stewardship fund, so yeah. Yep. But in a case like that, then the landowner doesn't have any say who is going to be monitoring that easement. No. That's right, and that's where so so no. from a legal standpoint, you don't you don't need the landowner's permission to transfer an easement. So, but the reality is, you'd be silly not to work on that relationship ahead of time, and that's what we did with all of the the easements that we assumed is the first thing before we did anything is go sit down with each of the landowners, kind of um, gauge their interest, um, and then went from there. So, but yeah, that's a great and, question. And in this case, all all the landowners but one um, actually formally signed an agreement saying we're happy to have our lease and go to Five Valleys Land Trust. Mm -hmm. so, and even the one that didn't sign it was happy to do it. They just didn't want to sign anything. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's not, it's not something that the landowner has to approve. Right. It's a lot better to have a proactive agreement and, and working relationship than fight things over. So when you get oh, a new, sure. oh, so you, when you get a new owner, what what do you do? Yeah, so that's a great question. Then that's called um, uh, successor ownership, yes. um, and um, and so so now we're at a kind of a critical point in conservation easement history where a lot of mm -hmm. lands are turning over that have easements on them, and so we're seeing this on a, <coughs> a lot. Of, on an annual basis. Okay. And so what we do is we, uh, during each monitoring visit, we ask the, the landowner to, hey, keep in mind if, if you sell or um, transfer any of your land, um, just you know, let us know and we'd love to meet with mm -hmm. the, the, you can sell it to whoever you want, of course, because it's your land, it's private property, but you know, do us a favor and let us meet with the person and, and talk with them and show them the terms of the easement so that it's very clear what the person's getting into. And um, because <coughs> what's happening, what, what can happen is the person that's donated the easement, they know all the terms of the easement because they're the ones that put them in there. But someone come along, buy the property, and they say, well, geez, this is a great deal. It's, it's selling for less than the um, neighboring property, for example. Mm -hmm. It has this thing called an easement on it. Um, I don't know what that is, but I'm not gonna worry about it too much. They buy the land and then we okay. meet with them and, and this is kind of a, just an example. I mean, it doesn't really happen this way, but then they, we start talking about goals and objectives for the property and the worst thing to find out is that they are not compatible with what the landowner wants to do. Mm -hmm. For example, I heard this, there was a, in, down in southwestern Montana, there was a property that sold and it prohibited domestic sheep because it was in a bighorn sheep wildlife corridor. And so domestic sheep, and because of pneumonia and such, don't, aren't compatible. Well, the guy, he thought, well, 
this is America, it's my property, I'll be able to do, I can run cheap if I want, and it, and it all went to court, and the judge said, no, you can't, because there's a conservation easement on it that says mm -hmm. you cannot have domestic sheep, and so, so it's a real deal, and like Payla says, it, it, they have teeth, and so if it's in the easement terms as a prohibited use, there, that's a prohibited use, so. Well, I'm aware of a rancher who's pretty unhappy because the easement trust is telling him he can't graze cattle on that part because it will harm the wildlife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I assume that's in the in the agreement. Well, and what would I, it, you know? I don't know. Well, and it'd be interesting the to see. Pretty unhappy. Yeah, and it'd be in, interesting to see if grazing is specifically prohibited in that exact area, and if it is, then the land trust doesn't have any choice but to uphold. Those terms. The, the impression I got was it was the 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 belief that grazing there would harm the wildlife, not the. And that's a much part. stickier issue there, and that's why. And Palin and I we talk about this a lot, mm -hmm. where stewardship staff and project staff need to communicate a lot because I would never want to be put in that situation to say, you know, it's my personal opinion that you, Mr. Rancher, who's been here for a hundred years you know, your family, that I'm saying this is going to harm the value of the property and hurt wildlife. It's, it's like a business, it's like having a partnership with business. You have to address every possible That's right. outcome. That's right. And grazing would be one of them. Right. And, and, our, and our, the easements that we write are, are very pro-working landscape. So grazing, timber harvest. I mean, all of those things are, are really what easements are protecting. It's, it's pretty rare anymore to see an easement that treats a property like a preserve, where, you know, there, I mean, there were some easements that were written that said no, no timber harvest, and we know now that that's just ridiculous. More, so, bad, more, yeah. more yeah. of the things you, you see. You're a timber harvest yeah. conference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I would think you would see that more in the case of, like, wildlife management programs or CRP. Right. That kind of thing. Right. Out of the, a whole different ballgame. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, where a lot of the easements that, I mean, kind of our line of thought is coming from um, the, like the, the, the Blackfoot bloodline, so to speak, of conservation easements that were formed to keep uh, a working farm and ranch area what it is. So that's, that's how, I think that's how we, at, at least at Five Valleys, think about easements, that it's, it's kind of preserving a, a place and not necessarily or protecting a place and not necessarily preserving. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It's, it's very fluid. <laughs> yeah. But different land trusts, you know, have different have different goals out there too. So that's just kind of our our approach, um, which is largely but generally that's good experience. good information. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Generally from you that's to what to look for. And yeah, and the good thing about I mean a conservation easement is you you can. So on that issue with grazing, what I would do is yeah. get out a magnifying glass and read every single word of the easement. And unless it said something in there about can't graze this particular area, then mm -hmm. it's fine. But then where the gray area comes in is if the land steward thought it was being severely harmed or mm -hmm. overgrazed. And, and we just almost never go there because it's so hard. I mean, Define what if it, over grazing. Yeah. Well, yeah, what if it's where that's where the families wintered their cattle for the past 80 years? And that's, right. of course, it's a stubble because it's a winter pasture and, and it's only five acres in size and this is how it's always been and the baseline condition should show that. But, mm -hmm. but you know, that brings up really good points. Um, so we just talked about some of this, the landowner, the relationship side, um, that it's really a, a partnership and, um, and we just try to work Land trusts in general try to work with the um, landowner at, you know, we're, not, we're on the same team, what I'm trying to say. Um, and then succession, um, how do we find out? You know, in Montana, we're pretty fortunate where we have the cadastral mapping system, and you can click on any property in the whole state, and it'll tell you who owns it at that time. But ideally, you'd find out that an easement is sold from the landowner, or if there's a real estate agent, we'll always call the real estate agent and 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 try to find out that way if a property is going to sell. Is there a a way that that's viewable by public? Oh yeah. Is that cadastral? 
Yeah, if you just if you just Google search Cadastro Montana, it'll take you to C A D. Yeah, C A D A S T R A L. And I guess cadastro means parcel. It's just a fancy way of saying parcel. Um, but it's a really slick program. It'll it'll tell you. I've seen it integrated with like Google Earth mm -hmm. and other mapping programs. Mm -hmm. so and different portions of it show where all the easements <coughs> are in Montana, and they often even show who holds the easement. So mm -hmm. we are really lucky to have that resource. Yep. Yeah, so so it's easy to find out who owns the property. It does, and it tells general values as far as what it, the property was appraised at for taxation purposes, but it's not an accurate reflection of what the property's worth. So, like if you bought a house and you know you paid three hundred thousand for it, it might actually say it was worth one hundred twenty nine thousand, but that's just for assessment value. So. Okay, and then violation resolutions. Um, so, so as Payled mentioned, now easements are real, and there are real prohibited um, uses, and there's real permitted uses. And so, where um, where violations come into play is when it's obvious that a prohibited use is happening on the property, and um, there's two different types of violations. One would be a landowner violation, which is the person who owns the property um, did something that caused a violation. The other one, which is almost more common, is a, is a third party violation. Um, and that would be maybe a, a neighbor or a leasee, um, somebody other than the landowner that caused a violation. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a great <laughs> example. Like Janet had mentioned earlier, the mineral rights. And so a, a perfect example of a third party easement violation would be if, say, Janet owns the property and lo and behold, here comes all the mining equipment and she can't do anything about it because she doesn't own the mineral rights. The land trust can't do anything about it because the mineral rights were signed before the conservation easement mm -hmm. and they um, strip mine the whole place. That's a big time third party easement violation. Of course we really want them to just pay for the lease, the easement. Yeah. The, the mineral rights. Fully acquired or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But so there, I mean, in that instance, we'd be in a real predicament because the mineral company had the right to do what they did, but it also violated the easement. But say if it wasn't a mineral company and it was a neighbor that came in and caused that kind of damage, then it would be the land trust's legal responsibility to see that whatever happened was um, <coughs> fixed. Yeah. yeah, was fixed. And so, so this here, you know, this is a pretty dramatic example of with a, um, with heavy equipment. Usually, violations aren't um, as drastic as um, a house being built in a wetland or, um, you know, the. Um, Overgrazing down to the stubble, or something like that. Usually, they're more um, they're more technical things that 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 aren't as blatant as, as like what what we're what you see here. Um, but but nonetheless, violations do happen, and we have a, a um, policies and procedure or procedure that you work through them. And um, and in the seven years I've been at Five Valleys, there's there's never been a case where the land trust has to um, take the landowner to court. So you, we have ended up in court before, but it's usually on the, the landowner and the land trust on like a boundary issue dispute or some, some small thing like that where you're in court, but you're on the landowner's side and you're both working through it together. Um, usually violations are just resolved um, over a cup of coffee and kind of behind the scenes and uh, usually there are misunderstandings um, on either on either part and you just again it comes back to that relationship that you just keep working at it and it's a it's a fluid um, agreement and you just keep keep moving forward um, but oh, but I will mention. So, if violations, if there if there is a really serious violation, and we ever did have to 
take a landowner to court, you have what's called um, a legal defense fund, and we have insurance um, through a company called Terra Firma. That so there's really big money that we could. I mean, in the million, I think it's a four and a half million dollar legal defense fund, plus this insurance. So if you really had to, you could push the issue. And so, but but you don't want to drain any of that money out. I mean, for one thing, it'd be awful for relationships, and then the other, it's going to cost a lot of money. So, so usually violations are just um, small in nature, not a huge deal for the resource, but need to be fixed, and you just slowly work with the landowner to get them get it worked out. And then the last thing I'll talk about is record keeping. Um, so the, the record keeping starts with the conservation easement itself that's recorded at the courthouse. And there's some other documents that need to be filed along with that, that, that kind of due diligence documents on how the easement was put in place. And then after that, you have your monitoring records, which is a uh, two or three page um, document that's filed each year and the accreditation standards um, requires us to keep uh, on-site, off-site, and fireproof safe and digital. So you have three different ways that you keep um, internal documents and the ones that are recorded at the public or at the courthouse are publicly accessible by anybody so that's public public information. Do you fall under ISO standards? Mm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Random questions, sorry. Yeah, probably not because I don't know what it stands for. So, <laughs> paperwork. Um, yeah, <laughs> lots of paperwork. That's right. Um, okay, and then I just want to transition quickly. How are we doing on time? Um, fee land stewardship. So, what we've talked about up till this point was with um, a conservation easement but land trusts also do own property. And we have a good example of that out at the confluence of Rock Creek and the Clark Fork River. Five Valleys Land Trust purchased about 280 acres of land there right at the mouth of Rock Creek. And, um, and it's owned by the land trust. And so we have, there's a whole different set of um, procedures that will follow with land that we that we own um, and so those things see it, it might be more resource intensive on our part because we actually own the property and so we would have ideas that we can implement without um, having to work with well, we are the landowner so we could do more things like a timber harvest um, weed control public access and on this particular property at Rock Creek there, there's um, going to be there's one public access point right now for, for fishing or hiking or for hunting access to the adjacent federal land, and there's going to be another one, another one put in. But, but that's a different type of stewardship there. Are you allowed to sell the property and re and maintain retain the mm -hmm. easement? Um, if Is that legally on fee legally land, like that? if yeah. we owned it, yeah. With this property, if we or is it property specific? Well, it'd be, it'd be property specific, but okay. if we were to ever sell land that was bought for conservation value, we would have an easement on it. So. Well, that's what I think. Yeah, you'd put an easement on it. Sell land and maintain, retain the easement. Yes, yes. Is but we couldn't put an easement on land that we, you can't hold the easement and own the land at the same time. But we could sell the land to you, but mm -hmm. put an easement on it at that So time. I just wonder if it was legal for you to yeah. do that. Yeah, but I don't think we can, you can't own the land and have an easement on your own land. Or legally you can, but it's not a good idea to do it with, okay. with the best practices. Right, that's right. Well, it certainly gives you a lot more flexibility if you don't. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so then the, the final thing in stewardship is, uh, is actually land management, and that comes to uh, where you, you, can, you can help landowners with some of the resource-based management um, if that if that's needed, but then also in land that you own, the fee land, there's a, a land management component um, that, that we also work on too. And I think, yeah, so that brings us to the end of our, our um, pre presentation, but if, you got, if anybody has questions for Pela or I, 
feel free to shout them out. Yep. What do you do in the case of, for instance, a utility corridor? If um, where a utility is, for instance, it's like power line. So um, and, they, and they're they're for instance they want to acquire uh, a permanent lease across mm -hmm. an easement to put a power line. Well, um, well, it's, um, one of the most labor intensive and time consuming aspects of putting an easement on the property is getting a really clear sense of the title to the property. And so we um, we have a title investigation done to just see are there any existing utility right. easements across the property, and then we look at them and try to understand um, with that existing easement, can we still protect the conservation values? Because that utility easement would have precedence over our conservation easement. If it was so pre-existing. If it was pre-existing. Right. But if it wasn't pre-existing, um, they would just be, we just have to figure it out on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, would it impact the conservation values? Does that particular easement prohibit new utility corridors? So, okay. um, but it would just be something you'd have to kind of look at you carefully. Look on at what the current property. land use is and what Yeah, for example, there's yeah. one that, that I just was looking at recently that um, utility easements are allowed for uh, the development of that particular property, but not right. for like if Northwest Energy wanted to put through uh, a gas line, uh -huh. yeah, through the property, then that would be a prohibited use. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be like if you reserve the spot to put a structure on in the future, that kind of thing would. Yeah, it's usually outlined in the easement. It gives you a really good idea <laughs> okay. of what's allowed and what and what isn't. Unless the government uses eminent domain. Exactly. Right. And, right. and that, yeah, that's something I wanted to touch on, too, is that the, that's really the only way an easement can kind of go away, so to speak, is through eminent domain. Mm -hmm. One example was around, along Route 200. There was a highway expansion being done, and there what, eminent domain was exercised on a very small sliver of a conservation easement. It was 0.2 acres or something like that. But, but yeah, essentially eminent domain made that easement go away. I wonder if that's happening on the Keystone. If there were, if there were conservation <laughs> easements there. That would be and, then, and then in that case, um, the, the land trust would have to receive some money um, well, that because of those the, public values that were government. taken from, <laughs> yeah. from the public. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we would then took that, take that money and put it in, into some kind of conservation that fit mm -hmm. the goals of that particular easement, even though it might just be, you know, maybe it'd be some restoration work on that mm -hmm. property or something. Because there seem to be landowners in, oh, you know, in Nebraska that don't want to let the, pro, the pipeline through. We've definitely gotten calls from people who are nervous about some something coming through their property, and they want to do an easement to prevent, you know, to make it harder for the government to use eminent domain to pass through the property. So whether or not that actually would be helpful, I don't know. <laughs> it didn't work with the power line out here. I know that. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> From the government side of that was a route. That was it. Yes. They decide. Yeah. They decide what they call public necessity. Yeah. Trumping mm -hmm. private yeah. ownership, and then yeah. they. The, I there. mean, the one thing. The one thing that maybe could be helpful is that this property um, has been protected to benefit the public, and so they have to argue that their public benefit of putting utility line is it's worth than the sacrificing route. the public benefit provided by that. Or there's no alternative route or something. Right, and <laughs> yeah, and in the and, and see, easements aren't designed to, um, you know, um, be a pain in the neck. So they're not. That's not their design is to purposely make people's lives more difficult. But but so but as long as you can tie a true degradation of what you're trying to protect to, say, a power line for it, then you have real feet to stand on. So that's another thing that you end up looking at then would be say where you're adjacent to public lands, mm -hmm. national forest or something like that, leaving public access mm -hmm. and so, or some route to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a greater net benefit. Yep. Okay. So yep. with respect to that, mm -hmm. would you say that that's generally a goal of the five dollar plan for us to preserve public access? Oh, it just it just depends. We have we have several goals. I mean, you know, protecting wildlife habitat and scenic mm -hmm. and agricultural values and recreational opportunities kind of are our goals that we think are all important. And um, when it's possible to have public access, that's great. Um, but it's definitely not a requirement. So 
um, it can be easier to fundraise for a project that has the public access um, but if a landowner isn't willing to grant it but you could still protect a lot of great wildlife habitat or agricultural land then we'll often still feel like that's something that we really that we're interested in signing mm -hmm. up to add to our workload forever to monitor yeah <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of it sounds like there's a lot of trying to weight the value of one aspect versus another mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. kind of like you do when you when you know you, you have a column of pros and cons yeah yep mm -hmm. and sometimes landowners might want to do an easement but they might want to retain the right to build five houses so would that mm -hmm. be worth it so and that's mm -hmm. that's some of the stuff that just takes so long it's just figuring out you know what what rights the landowners wants to give up to protect those natural values and you know does that you know that make sense for the land trust to sign up to enforce over time yeah and public and that's one of the misconceptions is is that um, we, we get calls every year usually around fall that says oh I see there's conservation easement on so-and-so's property um, you know when can I go hunt and that's like whoa no 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 that's still that's private property, property like yeah. anywhere else so unless there's a public access provision um, then it's 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 yeah it's just private land like any like anywhere else uh, what happens when the landowner comes to you and says he wants to change the terms? Well, that's a great question. And so, and Pele had mentioned earlier, there's there's a few, a very small set of reasons that you can change an easement, and that's called an amendment. And um, the IRS hates amendments, and um, we don't do a lot of amendments because they can get... Um, they're kind of sticky because an easement does last, an easement's forever. But but what you could change, you the kind of the basic rule is you can always tighten up the terms of an easement, but you can't um, give back rights that were taken away. So if a landowner came and said, you know, I've been thinking about this, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna pass this land on, or I'm getting ready to sell it, I really want to get rid of those three home sites on the bluff overlooking the river, for example. We could. Uh, do an easement or an amendment to the easement to tighten up the protection of the land, but you could never do it. I the, want to the, put one more home. Yeah, you can't do it the opposite. The opposite now. way. Yeah. And there, we actually, I mean, there's a landowner in the Blackfoot right now who's amending his easement because he wants stronger protections of the riparian corridor. So that's not that unusual. Adding more land, um, and then um, and you can also do amendments to fix. Um, mistakes in the easement, you know, because their easements are made by fallible human beings, so, you know, there's been times where there might be a little error to the legal description or something like that, but we can't undo the protections that have been afforded to the public through the easement um, by an amendment. Any other? Yeah? When the government agencies set up a conservation easement, do they follow the same stewardship practices where they meet once a year? They, that really varies, no way. and they—that's they, that's entirely um, dependent on. Yeah, because we, you know, our, our, we have adopted the standards and practices of our the National Trade Organ Association that we're part of, and then on top of that, we're accredited, um, and so and that's where that, and then just in the industry best practices to do it annually. But there's definitely. Uh, government owned ones that are not monitored every year or there's also in some some governmental entities feel like it's appropriate to just monitor them like by the air and not meet with the landowner whereas we always try to meet with the landowner because we feel like that's just as important as getting on the ground is actually connecting with the landowner so and we see a lot of variation in those government held <laughs> ones like um, the standards that the they, they steward their easements at yeah Read the fine print on some of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Always read the fine print. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, guys. And well, if yeah. anyone else has more questions afterwards and wants to visit, we can stay a little bit. And also, like I said, that we have our cards are in there. If you guys have more, more questions, um, feel free to give us a call or send us an email. Yeah, thanks thank, a lot. Thanks for your interest. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah.